Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and once again, I'll be your reader today. I always find it amazing how the mind connects seemingly random thoughts, especially if one is just sort of vegetating. Uh, it's raining as I speak. It's raining today, probably not when you're listening to this, but it's raining quite a lot, actually, which means that the little uh, rivulet and pond below my balcony is overflowing, which is great uh, and exciting. The ducks don't like it, but I like it. So it's raining uh, and I'm musing today, my favorite new word, musing. I'm musing about rainwater. Not sure how that came about, but uh, so the duck pond below me is the one that uh, you eventually know here in Camden. It continues on, uh, goes over a 15 foot dam to make a beautiful waterfall. Then it goes under the main street, USA of Peyton Place from years ago, goes under the Smiling Cow and then goes right into the harbor. Um, so I am very fortunate in having this wonderful balcony so I can watch both the ducks uh, and uh, every, everything else that's down there. Uh, so from there, my mind uh, seemed to go today in my musings to the great waterways of America. I was very fortunate in living on one of those great waterways for four years while I was uh, in graduate school in St. Louis. And obviously that was the Mississippi River. And then my mind went to a point uh, during that period where the Mississippi River was flooding, overflowing, very muddy, uh, and almost coming up, for those of you who know St. Louis, uh, past the riverboat, surely, uh, they were sort of bobbing, um, up to the arch, if you know where the arch is there on the waterfront. And so from there, I suddenly went from the Mississippi River to the Missouri River, <laughs> which flows into the Mississippi River. Uh, and then lo and behold, a little news flash this morning about flooding uh, in Boone County, which is near the Missouri River. Again, aren't these strange musings and the mind connecting things? And it's not too long a leap if you go from the great waterways of America to the great highways of America. And from the great highways of America, going from one point to another everywhere, more concrete than we ever dreamed we could make, uh, suddenly we get to the blue highways, the blue highways. And for those of you who ever had a Rand McNally map, you know that those blue highways are sort of the back roads of America, uh, leading into cities, but able to skirt cities uh, and one can actually go from one point to another pretty much anywhere in America by going on those back roads, those blue highways. So with all of those musings and mind connectings on a pouring rainy day, <laughs> I wish to introduce you to today's author who happens to live in Boone County on the Missouri River. I want to introduce you to William Least Heat Moon. William Least Heat Moon. William Least Heat Moon is a recognized American travel writer and also a historian of English, Irish, and Osage ancestry. That's the connection there with the name. However, William was born as William Trogdon. In 1939 in Kansas City, Missouri, he is certainly a uh, show me state man. He will celebrate his 82nd birthday in 22 days on August 27th. Now the Trogdon family name originates from Euro-American line lineage, uh, believe it or mostly English Irish. Uh, and the heat moon name reflects obviously his Osage lineage. Uh, William's father is Heat Moon. His elder brother is Little Heat Moon. And thus, William <laughs> is Least Heat Moon. I just love that. 
So Lee Smoon uh, grew up in Missouri, where he attended the University of Missouri, uh, a trio of degrees in English, bachelor's degree in 1961 and a master's in 1962 and a PhD in 1972. And then even later in 1978, a bachelor's degree in photojournalism uh, from the University of Missouri in, again, 1978. Until recently, uh, William Least Heat Moon served as a long time and highly popular from all the reports I read, <laughs> professor of English at his alma mater. As I mentioned, he lives in Boone County near the Missouri River, uh, obviously north of the confluence of the two rivers. So today's rainy day connects me to the Mississippi, connects me to the Missouri, connects me to Boone County, and connects me to William Least Heat Moon. Today we're going to read from, uh, I think, his highly recommended book and certainly his, uh, his most critically acclaimed book uh, called Blue Highways. Uh, Blue Highways uh, was published first in uh, 1982 and then again in 83 with uh, some additional material uh, and then in hardcover a little bit later on. Uh, it's a chronicle of a three month road trip uh, that least half moon heat moon took throughout the United States in 1978. Uh, after he had lost his teaching job temporarily due to cutbacks and had been separated from his first wife. So we all do different things when we're faced with trials and tribulations uh, in life. And his solution was to leave the heartland of America in Columbia, Missouri, uh, and to travel the United States. Um, he tells us that he traveled 13,000 miles as much as possible on secondary blue highways, secondary roads, trying to avoid all cities. Now, these, often, these roads were often drawn on maps in blue in the old style Rand McNally Road Atlas, hence the book title. Living out of his van, he visited small towns such as Nameless Tennessee. <laughs> Why they never named it is a great question. I might have to look that up. Hachita, New Mexico, and Bagley, Minnesota, to find places in America untouched by fast food and interstate highways. That was 1978. I wonder if one could still do that uh, without fast food. The book records his search for something greater than himself, greater than himself, and includes especially memorable encounters in roadside cafes. Least Half Moon's memoir reached the New York Times bestseller list in 1982-83 for 42 weeks. It was also the winner of the Christopher Award in 1984, quote, affirming the highest values of the human spirit. Mm, that I like. So today we are going to start his journey in, uh, in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, he speedily goes to parts of the world or parts of the country <laughs> through, ten through Kentucky, et cetera. He goes south. Then he goes along the Eastern seaboard all the way up to New England and to Maine, and then across the north and then across the west and then the south and then back up to Columbia. So he pretty much covers, and in the back of the book, there actually is a map of that journey, which is quite amazing. Uh, so what we're going to do is start the journey uh, and get us sort of moving away from Missouri. And then we're gonna cut right ahead to the chapter called Northeast, appropriately enough. And we'll pick it up as he moves from just west of the main New Hampshire border into Maine um, and just enjoy some of his storytelling. So let us begin at the beginning, as the good book says. And William starts by saying, beware thoughts that come in the night. <laughs> they aren't turned properly. They come in askew, free of sense and restriction, deriving from the most remote of sources. Take the idea of February 17, 
a day of canceled expectations. The day I learned my job teaching English was finished because of declining enrollment at the college. The day I called my wife from whom I'd been separated for nine months to give her the news, the day she let slip about her friend, Rick or Dick or Chick, something like that. That morning before all the news started hitting the fan, Eddie Shortleaf, who worked a bottomland section of the Missouri River and plowed snow off campus sidewalks, told me if the deep cold didn't break soon, the trees would freeze straight through and explode. Indeed. That night, as I lay wondering whether I, should, I would get sleep or explosion, I got the idea instead. A man who couldn't make things go right could at least go. He could quit trying to get out of the way of life. Chuck routine, live the real jeopardy of circumstance. It was a question of dignity. The result, on March 19th, the last night of winter, I again lay awake in the tangled bed, this time doubting the madness of just walking out on things, doubting the whole plan that would begin at daybreak to set out on a long, equivalent to half the circumference of the earth, circular trip over the back roads of the United States. Following a circle would give a purpose, to come round again, where taking a straight line would not. And I was going to do it by living out of the back end of a truck. But how to begin a beginning? A strange sound interrupted my tossing. I went to the window, the cold air against my eyes. At first I saw only starlight, then they were there. Up in the March blackness, two entwined skeins of snow and blue geese honking north, an undulating W-shaped configuration across the deep sky white bellies glowing eerily with the reflected light from town, necks stretched northward. Then another flock pulled by, who knows what of the South to breed and remake itself. A new season. Answer, begin by flowing, following spring as they did, darkly with neck stuck out. The vernal equinox came on gray and quiet, a curiously still morning, not winter and not spring, as if the cycle paused, because things go their own way. My daybreak departure turned to a morning departure, then to an afternoon departure. Finally, I climbed into the van, rolled down the window, looked a last time at the rented apartment. From a dead elm, sparrow hawks used each year, came a high wee as the nestlings squealed for more grub. I started the engine. When I returned a season from now, if I did return, those squabs would be gone from the nest. Accompanied only by a small gray spider crawling the dashboard, kill a spider and it will rain. I drove into the street, around the corner, through the intersection, over the bridge, onto the highway. I was heading toward these little towns that get on the map, if they get on at all, only because some cartographer has a blank space to fill. Remote Oregon, Simplicity, Virginia, New Freedom, Pennsylvania, New Hope, Tennessee. Why Arizona? Why not Mississippi? I go California, just down the road from, oh no, here I come. A pledge. I give this chapter to myself. When done with it, I will shut up about that topic. Call me least heat moon, 
My father calls himself Heat Moon. My elder brother, Little Heat Moon. I, coming last, am therefore least. It has been a long lesson of a name to learn. To the Suin peoples, the Sioux tribe, the moon of heat is the seventh month, a time also known as the blood moon, I think because of its dusky midsummer color. I have other names, Buck, once a slur, never mind the predominant Anglo features, also Bill Trogdon. The Christian names come from a grandfather eight generations back, one William Trogdon, an immigrant Lancastershireman living in North Carolina, who was killed by the Tories for providing food to rebel patriots and thereby got his name in volume four of Makers of America. Yet to the red way of thinking, a man who makes peace with the new by destroying the old is not to be honored, so I hear. One summer when Heat Moon and I were walking the ancestral grounds of the Osage near the river of that name in Western Missouri, we talked about bloodlines. He said, each of the people from anywhere, when you see in them far enough, you find red blood and a red heart. There's a hope. Nevertheless, a mixed blood, let his heart be where it may, is a contaminated man who will be trusted by neither red nor white. The attitude goes back to a long history of perfidious half-breeds, men who by their nature had to choose against one of their bloodlines. As for me, I will choose the heart for spirit, but never will I choose the blood. One last word about bloodlines. My wife, a woman of striking mixed blood features, came from the Cherokee. Our battles, my Cherokee and I, we called the Indian Wars. <laughs> For these reasons, I named my truck Ghost Dancing, a heavy-handed symbol alluding to ceremonies of the 1890s in which the Plains Indians wearing cloth shirts they believed rendered them indestructible, danced for the return of warriors, bison, and the fervor of the old life that would sweep away the new. Ghost dances, desperate resurrection rituals were the dying rattles of a people whose last defense was delusion about all that remained in them in their futility. A final detail. On the morning of my departure, I had seen 38 blood moons, an age that carries its own madness and futility. With a nearly desperate sense of isolation and a growing suspicion that I lived in an alien land, I took to the open road in search of places where change did not mean ruin, and where time and men and deeds connected. The first highway, Interstate 70, eastbound of Columbia, Missouri. The road here follows more or less the Boone Slick Trail, the initial leg of the Oregon Trail. It also parallels both the southern latitude of the last great glacier in central Missouri, as well as the northern boundary of the Osage Nation. The Cherokee and I had skirmished its length in Missouri and Illinois for 10 years, and memory made for hard driving that first day of spring. But it was the fastest route east out of the homeland. When memory is too much, turn to the eye. So I watched particularities. Item, a green and grainy and corrupted ice over the ponds. Item, blackbirds 
passing like storm-born leaves, sweeping just above the treetops, moving as if invisibly tethered to one will. Item, Brown, barn roofs painted visit Rock City, see seven states, seven at one fell swoop. People loved it. Item, uprooted fence rows of Osage orange, so-called hedge apples, although they are in the mulberry family. The Osage made bows and war clubs from the limbs. The trunks with a natural fungicide carried the first telegraph lines and roots furnished dye to make doughboy uniforms olive drab. Now the Osage Orange were going so were going so bigger tractors could work longer rows. At High Hill, two boys were flying gaudy butterfly kites that pulled hard against their leashes. No string, just flight. A town of surprising flatness on a single main street of turn of the century buildings paralleling the interstate. High Hill sat golden in a piece of sunlight that broke through. No one moved along the street and things held so still and old. The town looked like a diorama in a museum. 80 miles out, rain started popping the windshield and the road became blobby headlights and green interstate signs for this exit, that exit. Last exit to elsewhere, I crossed the Missouri River, not far upstream from where Lewis and Clark on another wet spring afternoon set out for Mr. Jefferson's terra incognita. Then to the southeast under a glowing skullcap of fouled sky lay St. Louis. I crossed the Mississippi as it carried its 40 hourly tons of topsoil to the Louisiana Delta. The tumult of St. Louis behind, the Illinois super wide quiet, but for the rain, I turned south onto State 4, a shortcut to I-64. After that, the 42,500 miles of straight and wide could lead to hell, for all I cared. I was going to stay on the 3 million miles of bent and narrow rural American two lane the roads to Podunk and Tunerville. Into the sticks, the boondocks, the bergs, backwaters, jerkwaters, the wide spots in the road, the don't blink or you'll miss it towns. Into those places where you say, my God, what have you lived here? The middle of nowhere. The early darkness came on, my headlamps cut only a 40 foot trail through the rain and the dashboard lights cast a spectral glowing. Sheet lightning behind the horizon of trees made the sky look like a great faded orange cloth being blown about. Then darkness soaked up the light and for a moment I was blinder than before. In the approaching car beams, raindrops spattering the road became little beacons. I bent over the wheel to steer along the divider stripes. A frog, long leggedy and green, belly flopped across the road to the side where the puddles would be better. The land, still cold and wintry, was alive with creatures that trusted in the coming of spring. On through Lebanon, a brick street village where Charles Dickens spent a night in the Mermaid Inn. On down the Illinois roads, roads that leave you ill and annoyed, the joke went, all the way dodging chuck holes that Time Magazine said Americans would spend $626 million in extra fuel swerving around. Then on to I-64, a new interstate that cuts across Southern Illinois and Indiana without going through a single town. If a world lay out there, it was far from me. 
on and on, behind only a red wash of taillights. At Grayville, Illinois, on the Wabash River, I pulled up for the night on North Street and parked in front of the old picture show. The marquee said, travelogue today, or it would have if the O's had been there. I should have gone to a cafe and struck up a conversation. Instead, I stumbled to the bunk in the back of my rig, undressed, zipped into the sleeping bag, and watched things go dark. I fought desolation and wrestled memories of the Indian Wars. First night on the road, I've read that fawns have no scent so that predators cannot track them down. For me, I heard the past snuffling about somewhere close. The rain came again in the night and moved on east to leave a morning of cool overcast. In Wells Restaurant, I said to a man whose cap told me what fertilizer he used, you've got a clean little town here. Grayville's bigger than a whale, but the oil riggers get us a mite dirty around the ears, he said. I've got no oil myself, not that I haven't drilled up a sieve. He jerked his thumb heavenward. Gave me beans, but if I'd have got my rightful druthers, I'd have took oil. He adjusted his cap. So what's your line? Don't have one. How's that work? It doesn't, and it isn't. <laughs> he grunted and went back to his coffee. The man took me for a bindle stiff. Next time I'd say I sold ventilated aluminum awnings or repaired long rinse cycles on whirlpools. Now my presence disturbed him. After the third tilt of his empty cup, he tried to make sense of me by asking where I was from and why I was so far from home. I hadn't traveled even 300 miles yet, I told him. I planned to drive around the country on the smallest roads I could find. Damn, he said, if screwball things don't happen every day, even in this town. The country's all alike now. On that second day of the new season, I guess I was his screwball thing. Along the road, old snow hidden from the sun lay in sooty heaps. But the interstate ran clear of cinders and salt deposits. The culverts gushed with slush and slosh, and the streams covering the low cornfields filled the oiled old soil with richness gathered in their meanderings. Driving through the washed land in my small self-propelled box, a wheel estate, a mechanic had called it, I felt clean and almost disentangled. I had what I needed for now, much of it stowed under the wooden bunk. One sleeping bag and blanket, one Coleman cooler, empty but for a can of chopped liver a friend had given me so there would always be something to eat. One Rubbermaid basin and a plastic gallon jug, the sink, one Sears and Roebuck portable toilet, one Optimus 8R white gas cook stove, hardly bigger than a can of beans, one knapsack of utensils, a pot, a skillet, one U.S. Navy sea bag of clothes, one toolkit, one satchel of notebooks, pens, road atlas, and a micro cassette recorder, two Nikon F2 35 millimeter cameras and five lenses, two Vade Mecums, Whitman's Leaves of Grass, and Nihard's Black Elks Speak. In my belfold were four gasoline credit cards at $26. Hidden under the dash were the remains of my savings account, $428. Ghost Dancing, a 1975 half-ton Econolane, the smallest van Ford then made, rode self-contained but not self-containing. 
So I hoped. It had two worn rear tires and an ominous knocking in the water pump. I'd converted the van from a clangy tin box into a place at once a six by 10 bedroom, kitchen, bathroom, parlor. Everything simple and lightweight, no crushed velvet upholstery, no wine racks, no built-in television. It came equipped with power nothing and drove like what it was, a truck. Your basic plumber's model. The Wabash divides Southern Illinois from Indiana. East of the fluvial flood plain, a sense of the unknown, the addiction of the traveler began seeping in. Abruptly, Pokeberry Creek came and went before I could see it. The interstate afforded every passage over the Hoosier land. So easy, it gave no sense of the up and down of the country. Worse, it hid away the people. Life doesn't happen along interstates. It's against the law. At the Huntingburg exit, I turned off and headed for the Ohio River. Indiana 66, a road so crooked it could run for the legislature, took me into the hilly fields of Chew Mail Pouch Barns, past Christ of the Ohio Catholic Church, through the Swiss town of Tell City, with its statue of William Tell and his crossbow and nervous son. On past the Old, Stern River, Old Stone Riverfront houses in Canelton, on up along the Ohio, the muddy bank sometimes now 10 feet from the road, the brown water rolled and roiled. Under wooded bluffs, I stopped to stretch among the per periwinkle. At the edge of a field, Sulfur spring bubbled up beneath a cover of dead leaves. At the end, uh, Shawnees once believed in the curative power of the water, and settlers even bottled it. It cleared the small spring for a taste, bad enough to cure something. I crossed into the eastern time zone, and then over the Blue River, which was a brown creek. Blue, green, red, yes. Yet, who ever heard of a brown river? For some reason, the farther west the river and the scarce of the water, the more honest the names became. Stinking water branch, dead horse fork, cutthroat gulch, damnation creek. <laughs> he couldn't be making these up. Perhaps the old trailmen and prospectors figured settlers would be slower to build along a river named Calamity. On through what was left of White Cloud, through the old state house town of Coroiden, I drove to get the miles between me and home. Daniel moved, moved, Daniel Boone moved on at the sight of smoke from a new neighbor's chimney. I was moving from the sight of my own. Although the past may not repeat itself, it does rhyme, Mark Twain said. As soon as my worries became only the old immediate worries of the road, when's the rain going to stop? Who can you trust to fix a water pump around here? Where's the best pie in town? Then I would slow down. I took the nearest Ohio River Bridge at Louisville, and whipped around the city and went into Pee Wee Valley and on to LaGrange, where seven daily Louisville and Nashville freight trains ran right down the main street. Then Southeast, curling, dropping, trying to follow a stream, Kentucky 53 looked as if it needed someone to take the slack out of it. On that gray late afternoon, the creek ran full and clear under the rock ledges that dripped out the last meltwater. In spite of snowpacks here and about, a woman bent to the planting of a switch of a tree. One man tilled mulch into his garden. Another cleaned a birdhouse. At Shelbyville, I stopped for supper and the night. Just outside the town and surrounded by cattle and pastures, was Claudia Sanders' dinner house, 
a low building attached to an old brick farmhouse with red roof. I didn't make the connection in names until I was inside and saw a mantle full of coffee mugs of a smiling Colonel Harlan Sanders. Claudia was his wife. And the Colonel once worked out of the farmhouse before the great buckets in the sky poured down their golden bounty of extra crispy. The dinner house specialized in Kentucky ham and country style vegetables. I waited for a table. A man in a suit of sharp creases and his wife, her jacket, lying as straight as an accountant's left margin, suggested I join them. You can't be as dismal as you look, she said. Just hunger, we decided. Hunger's the word, I said. We talked and I sat waiting for the question. I got there before the olives and celery. What do you do, the husband asked. I told my lie, turned it to a joke, and then gave an answer too long. As I talked, the man put a pair of forks, a spoon, and a knife into the lever system that changed directions twice before lifting his salad plate. He said, I noticed that you use work and job interchangeably. Oughtn't to do that. A job's what you force yourself to pay attention to for money. With work, you don't have to force yourself. There are a lot of jobs in this country, and that's good because they keep people occupied. That's why they're called occupations. The woman said, Cal works at General Electric in Louisville. He's a metallurgical engineer. I don't work there. I'm employed there, he said to her. Then to me, I'm supposed to spend my time imagineering. But the job isn't so much a matter of getting something new made. It's a matter of making it look like we're getting something made. You know what my work is? You make it look like you're getting something made. You know what I pay attention to? Covering my tracks. Pretending. Covering my tracks and getting through another day. That's my work. Imagineering's my job. It isn't that bad, darling. It isn't that bad on a stick. What I do doesn't matter. There's no damn future whatsoever in what I do. And I don't mean built in obsolescence. What I do begins and stops each day. There's no convergence between what I know and what I do, and even less with what I want to know. Now that he was hoisting his wife's salad plate, rolling her cherry tomato around, you've learned lots, she said, just lots. I've learned this, Twinkie. When America outgrows engineering, we'll begin to have something. Let's end in Louisville and let's go to New England. <laughs> Remember that he has gone south, <clears throat> excuse me, from nameless Tennessee, 96 South Carolina, Conyers, Georgia, um, and Othello, New Jersey. Shakespeare would be happy. All the way up from there to Cape Porpoise, Maine. Now we're talking our part of the world. And he comes to us uh, up from Massachusetts, up in New Hampshire, and then across into Maine. So let's see where he finds himself and what stories he could tell us about Maine. Fall River, Massachusetts is chiefly memorable for me as the factory city I have never driven through without losing the way. Once there, predictably, inexplicably, and utterly, I am confounded by the knots of concrete. So that day, entangled again, it was like old times. Maybe that's what set me up to expect Newport to be the same. Let me get to another section here, which I skipped by mistake. Blue Highway 109 ran out of Melvin Village, New Hampshire, out from under the Osipi Mountains, down toward the sea, all the way twisting like snarled fish line as it unreeled through an eerie spruce forest. 
I crossed into Maine, where evergreens absorbed the heat and the sky darkened. Lakes glowed luminescent in the last light, the water sending wisps of condensation into the cool air. Although I was still miles from the ocean, a heavy sea fog came in to muffle the obscure woods and lie over the land like a sheet of dirty muslin. I saw no cars or people, few lights in the houses. The windshield wipers, brushing at the fog, switched back and forth like cat's tails. I lost myself, at, so the momentous rhythm and darkness as past and present fused and dim things came and went in a staccato of moments separated by miles of darkness. On the road where change is continuous and visible, time is not. Rather, it is something the rider only infers. Time is not the traveler's fourth dimension. Change is. The towns of Maine, Springvale, Sanford, Kennebunk, watery globs of blue light washed across the windows in the cold downpour that came on. I pushed the wipers to high speed, but the rain had its own way. I drove on until the road crossed a small drawbridge over an estuary at Kennebunk Port, the fifth oldest village in Maine. Just above the sea reach, I stopped for the night. I'd come again to the Atlantic. Kennebunk Port was a town coming and going, a place in that way like any other. A quarter of a mile up the estuary from the ocean, the citizens once built large wooden ships on the north side of the river and unloaded fish downstream on the south. At Government Wharf, they still unloaded fish and lobsters, and the boat building continued too, but on a smaller scale. In that earlier time, the Baptist constructed a fine wood frame church that looks down the estuary, and on the steeple, they put a weather vane in the form of a golden fish. I asked four people what kind of fish it was. One said, what fish? <laughs> One said it was merely a generalized Christian symbol. Two others said, cod. I don't suppose the Baptist prayed to fish, but it did look that way. But cod giveth and cod taketh away, and cod fishing is no longer what it was. Were the Baptists to put up a weather vane today, they might erect a great golden traveler's check. The storm passed inland, and by morning the sky was clear and warm and squealing with gulls scratching themselves in flight. In 1830, some of the townspeople sighted a sea monster. But things now were quieter, except during the summer, and that was the way it had been for almost a century. I did what you do in Kennebunk Port, Maine walk the odd angles and sudden turns of alleyways and cul-de-sacs among the bleached shingled buildings, climb the exterior stairs to the old lofts, step around lobster pots and upturned dinghies. The summer season was coming on and already middle matrons in non-skid soled shoes and wraparound skirts were leading middle-level husbands into shops rigged out in macrame and down counters of perfumed candles, stained glass mobiles, Snoopy beach towels, brass trivets, ceramic coffee mugs from Japan, music box cheese boards, ladybug jewelry. Clerks, a generation younger, watched with expressions stuck on their decals. Most of those visitors stayed on the north side of the river with the gift shops and galleries selling paintings by artists, with the motels, restaurants, and tour boat docks. 
but a few found their South Side eatery small and slanty, the ones on pilings out over the river. And some people even wandered into the boatyards where winches and cranes clanged out the old music of the harbor. Music of the harbor. I went down to the shore. People lay in the sand of a narrow beach blocked at both ends by big wooden mounds of glaciated rocks. Children dug holes, mothers read fat novels by women with three names, and fathers read the co-ed's damp t-shirts. Later, the women would stretch out on towels, the men doze off until the Wall Street, under the Wall Street Journal, and the children look for something to do away from the blowing sand, cold water, and 600 yards of salted humanity. I drove a hilly black back road a couple of miles up the coast to Cape Porpoise, a white picket fence village bent around a little balloon of an inlet off the Atlantic. Here, in 1629, Englishmen made the first so-called permanent settlement in Kennebunkport. Sixty years later, Indians depopulated Cape Porpoise. This first settlement was on Stage Island, now an overgrown rise that looms and gulls rallied on. At the edge of the town pier sat a lobster house. Lobsters were beyond my means, but I bought two pounds of steamed quahogs, also called little necks and cherry stones when small, walked to Bradbury Brothers Grocery for a stick of butter and two bottles of Molson ale. I packed up my dented aluminum pot and Swedish stove and headed down through the sumac and wild beech roses to a rocky coin of vantage just above a tidal cove Vikings likely saw. While the tide went out, I melted the butter and warmed the clam broth, dipped the steamers into the broth and hot butter and ate, sitting against the granite, drinking the Molson's, watching the water. The tide drained the flats with their sea-worn things that once belonged in the air, now returned to it for a short space. Sunken punts, busted lobster pots, barnacle timbers, pop bottles. And there were banks of shining steely blue mussels, clothes tighter than the lips of God. At one time, only gulls harvested the black mussel. But when tidal flat clams and lobsters became harder to find, people began gathering mussels for steaming, and now they too were not so plentiful. Herring gulls flashing white in the sun circled down and let loose their usual hullabaloo, picked over the flats and cocked a careful eye at, every, at little tidal pools full of orange rockweed and iridescent froth washing gently back and forth. They stitched the tank, the rank black ooze with an embroidery of gull feet. I went again to the pier. Old men had come down in valiance and dodged darts and started watching the fishing boats. Somebody said they came every day, just like the gulls. Always when one died off, another took his place to do the watching. A westerly had blown in strong, and the little Cape Porpoise fleet was returning early, each boat carrying into the pier an attendant flap doodle of gulls circling as sternmen gutted the catch, then swooping the water for the pitched entrails. Trucks from Boston fish houses waited under the hoist as the fish tubs came up. Gill netters tore mackerel loose from nets and threw them into baskets. The mackerel is a beautiful piece of design, a sleek body of silver touched with indigo. An old watcher said, a mac looks better than it eats unless you're a cat. <laughs> The trawler, Allison E., tied up to unload her catch of flounder, cod, haddock, and hake. 
The skipper climbed the pier ladder and said, it's steak and potatoes for me, boys. He kept an eye on the trawler as his crew cut the last of the catch and he counted the basket of fish counting, uh, coming up to the truck. The whole time I stood at his side and asked questions. Finally, he said, if you really wanna see how a flounder gets from 20 leagues down to the A&P, be on the pier tomorrow morning at 3.30. If you won't get seasick, you can go out with us. <laughs> the Allison E was the last to unload. When she moved off to tie up in the little basin, the pier emptied. In late afternoon, schoolboys came down with their Zebcos to fish for Pollock. They filched chunks of cod and flounder from the fowl shed where lobster bait festered in barrels. The stronger the bait, the better the lure a lobster. One small boy struggled out with a massive codfish head. Its jagged maw, a good 14 inches across, gaping wide enough to swallow him. But the boys had no luck and went home when the eastern sky and sea turned inky in the dust. I parked ghost dancing on a flat outcropping of rock just above the pier. Circles of yellow lichens lay over the stone like doilies and broken mussel and crab shells dropped by gulls were all about. From my bunk, I could see out the back window the blinking light on Goat Island, a rocky ribbon once fought over by the British and colonists. On beyond, from deep water, the sorrowing drone of a sauna buoy. To be able to get up at three, I went to bed early, but couldn't fall asleep. I kept hearing music an old kind of music coming over the harbor from the village. The melody sounded so much like another time. I thought I imagined it, but it kept drifting softly across the basin like a dream. I got up and followed the sound along the road to Atlantic Hall, a last century clapboard building that was the town meeting house, library, and dance hall. Parked around were Volkswagens, Saabs, Peugeots, Renaults, and an old camouflaged truck with a canoe rack. Each bumper carried a message. Split wood, not atoms. Save the whale. Extinct is forever. Viva La Bicicleta, <laughs> bicycle. <laughs> From the second floor of the hall, music and the thump of feet. Under the roof timbers, a band. Upright piano, fiddle, flute, and banjo of immense size was letting go with a bond dance piece while dancers went up and down, stopping only to drink water from enamel wear pitchers. The cool sea wind blew through the loft and pushed the sweaty air into the night. Resting on the stairs was a student from Boston University who had come to Kennebunkport to do research on tide mill design. I'm studying the old grist mill on the Kennebunk River, he said. It's a restaurant now, but up until a few years ago, it was still milling. Same family read it for 200 years. Simple engineering, but ingenious. Yankee all the way. He explained how it worked. A rising tide entered the pond through a gate in the mill dam. At high tide, the miller closed the gate to trap the water. As the tide ebbed, the pond drained through a turbine connected to the millstone. It worked only twice every 24 hours, once at night, but the energy was free, endless, and non-polluting. I'm interested in a model that would operate with the tide coming and going, so there's a ready power most any time. 
The Bay of Fundy, maybe you know, is not far north of here. Twice a day there, you have 100 billion tons of water rising and falling 50 feet. 200 million horsepower every day. He drew a sketch of the old mill turbine with his modifications. People think hydropower is a grand coolie dam, big. But little is valuable too, especially in New England where heating oil is expensive and falling water is cheap. A lot of tide and streams get wasted now. And you wouldn't believe the number of little hydro plants on town dams that have been abandoned in the last 30 years. If we developed only 10% of the small existing dams in the country, we could save a couple hundred million barrels of oil a year. As I see it, that grist mill may be the oldest thing in Kennebunkport, but it's also the most futuristic. <laughs> Wonderful there, wonderful. Clever Boston University student. Well, the story does go on and he does go out on the boat, actually. <laughs> it's quite hilarious. I wish we had the time to, uh, to follow that. It starts at 3.30 a.m. and the chapter goes by timeline. So 3.40, 3.50, and it does keep going finally uh, until daybreak. It's quite hilarious because obviously the man uh, from Columbia, Missouri <laughs> is not a boatman on uh, the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> so I do recommend the book dearly. I think it's a wonderful, as you could tell, his word choices and his observations. He really is what the French call a flaneur, uh, someone who just observes people particularly, but also everything around him he sees instead of simply driving straight ahead and watching the gas gauge. Uh, he sees everything. I, I so admire people like that who see the world and don't just pass through the world. I wanted to end with a very tiny uh, piece on page 412, the very end, just before we get to this map. Uh, it is lines from a Navajo wind chant. Then he was told, remember what you have seen because everything forgotten returns to the circling winds. Oh, that's quite wonderful, I think. Remember what you have seen because everything forgotten returns to the circling winds. It's a marvelous book, Blue Highways by William Least Heat Moon, a Missouri man born and bred with uh, very strong ties to his Osage uh, background um, and a fascinating book. As if you like travel books and he does take you a long way, actually, he does go from New England, I should tell you the rest of that tale, to Harbor Beach, Michigan, Bagley, Minnesota, Shelby, Montana, Liberty Bond, Washington, Hat Creek, California, Cedar Breaks, Utah, Hatchetta, New Mexico, way on the south, Dime Box, Texas. <laughs> hilarious it's like some of the towns that we all run into when we're traveling anyway thank you for joining me with blue highways today with william least heat moon we're going to stay on a main theme next week uh and we're going to explore uh another uh bit of ingenuity uh mr heat moon was ingenious and thinking that he would go around the country and then see where his next life chapter would bring him well, this main ingenuity is a marvelous book uh, called Down East Genius. Down East Genius is written by Earl H. Smith. Um, and I'm just going to read uh, the little section that I snagged out of Seniors Magazine, actually. The genius Thomas Edison once said, all anyone needed in order to invent something was a good imagination and a pile of junk. 
Imagination and creativity has always been essential qualities for survival in Maine. And the ingrained habits of saving up and making do inevitably led to heaps of junk. As a result, Maine has produced some extraordinary inventors and inventions, with many aimed at simply making daily life easier and more comfortable. From Joseph Peavy's self-named tool that dramatically improved log driving, to Chester Greenwood's earmuffs, to Charles Forster's toothpicks, to Hiram Maxim's machine gun, to the L.L. Bean hunting shoe. <laughs> so the book uh, is 152 pages, and it's absolutely chock full with things that you would never imagine would come from Maine. But we are clever ducks here in Maine, aren't we? <laughs> and if there's a problem to be solved, we're very practical. And that's what this book's all about. So I do hope you'll join me, Down East Genius. The subtitle says, From Earmuffs to Motor Cars, Maine Inventors Who Changed the World. That's next week's story. I hope you'll join me for a couple of giggles and a whole lot of new trivia that you never ever knew before. Thank you for joining me on Camden Public's Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. We do have a dedicated email address in case you'd like to comment on today's reading or any other of our readings since last uh, October. Um, or if you'd like to suggest a book, we always welcome that uh, input. Uh, the address is friday-explorations, with an S, at usa.net, friday-explorations, with an S, at usa.net. Thank you for joining me on what is a very rainy day here, from my house to your house, <laughs> and by the time you watch this, maybe the sun will be shining. Uh, if you're not happy with the weather in Maine, just wait five minutes, as they always say. <laughs> Thank you for joining me on my musings about the rain and water and waterways and then highways and then finally blue highways. I hope you'll join us again. Thank you very much. Have a great week ahead. Goodbye.